Hey guys, Akil Stokes here. In today's episode, we're going to talk about adding filters, perhaps too many filters, to your trading strategy to the point where you're overfitting it. And is overfitting actually a thing? We're going to discuss that in today's episode. If you haven't done so already, make sure you check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Akil Stokes. We've got weekly live streams there of my live trading room, Tuesday through Thursday, 7.30 a.m. New York. We also have my Trading Edge video, which has been coming out every weekend for the last 10 plus years. I don't know. Um, YouTube.com slash Akil Stokes. Check it out. Subscribe. Hit that notification bell. That way you don't miss the latest upload. And we'll start with the one on filters. Boo is in here. That's awesome. Um, and he says, Akil, I have a question for you regarding the use of different filters on different instruments. I know I've asked you this question before with your answer being, yes, it's okay to have different filters for different instruments, but I just wanted to gain insight into your personal trading and use of varying filters between pairs while trading the same underlying strategy. So what we're talking about is having different rules for different pairs, right? So we all know what it is to have a trading strategy. We all know what it is to have a portfolio of pairs, right? A, a grouping of pairs or instruments that you're trading. Um, the question is about, hey, can I have specific rules or, or little tweaks or differences between the rules of say how I trade the dollar yen versus how I trade the pound yen. And the trader says, the main point of concern that I have is overfitting my strategy to each pair by finding the filters that work best on each pair and using them as entry criteria. I don't want to overfit to the point where these filters work really well on historical data but won't necessarily work well in the future. Jason says to treat each pair like an employee, I understand the logic behind this, given each pair has a different personality and associated price movement. However, I also know that price action on different pairs are in many ways the same. So realistically, how different can you treat each pair without risking overfitting and still maintaining a robust and predictive result? Um, I have some different additional questions below, but I'll, I'll get to that later. So the first the first question, and, and this is I, I told him I'd, I'd bring this to the group because I think it's it's awesome to hear other traders' opinions and not just mine. So here's here's a question I have for you: Is overfitting a real thing? And if it is a real thing, is it caused by filters? Right. So is is overfitting a concern that we actually need to have or is it something that perhaps isn't as prevalent as we think? What do you guys think about that? What do you think about that? Or she says overfitting means too many filters. Well, yeah, so overfitting, and, and Abu, you can chime in if you want, if, if you have a, a different definition of it. When I think of overfitting, overfitting is basically doing too much. So you're, you're adding so many filters or, or so many tweaks that you're, you're basically, it, it's kind of like curve fitting in a sense. Um, where so so curve fitting is like this. this this is what curve fitters will do and this is why i think overfitting is a little bit different and not as maybe not as much of a concern as you think um although there, there is a nature to overfitting which we'll get to so curve fitting is this and this is typically how you see it in like the 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 scammy way right so let's say i am a trader that has this this strategy right i'm, I'm a trader i'm an educator i'm a salesman i have this strategy and I'm marketing that this strategy is 90% correct and it gives you a 30 or a, an 80% return on average per month. So what curve fitting would be is essentially, I have all my data, right? All my data for my tested period for whatever strategy I'm trading, right? And what I'm doing is when I'm marketing it, right, in air quotes to you, right? I'm only looking at the sample size that performed the best. 
and I'm talking about those statistics. Does that make sense? So imagine your hottest hot streak. Instead of worrying about the drawdown that came before it, the drawdown that came after it, when I market to you, and it's not technically lying, it's just not the full picture. When I'm marketing to you whatever I'm selling, I'm saying, hey, 90% hit rate during this 10 trade period, 30 or what I say, 80% return per month during only this 10 trade period. <laughs> and you don't mention the fact that before the trend, 10 trade period, there's a 20% drawdown. After the 10 trade period, there's a 50% drawdown with a hit rate of 30%, right? So it's it's all that, um, you, you ever watch those, 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 like, those pill commercials where it's like, take Neurogetic and it'll clear up your sinuses right away. Warning, use of Neurogetic may cause heart cancer, brain cancer, and lung malfunction. Please consult your doctor. If you are over 25 and below 26, you should not take this right. All that fine print stuff at the end where it's like, yeah, like this stuff will cause more things like explosive diarrhea and head falling off and blindness, right? All the stuff that it causes that they don't mention, but it also clears up your, your, <laughs> it clears up your runny nose, right? So that's, that's kind of what curve fitting is. And again, you, you see this a lot in the, um, in the scammy stuff, but but you, you also see traders do this in their in their back testing results as well, right? So let's say again, let's say Orsi has this strategy she's testing, and you know we always say you want to test, you know, try to find a hundred trade sample size, try to look at um, you know five years, ten years of data. This would imagine if Orsi did this. Orsi started her back testing off. First month was fantastic. Boom. Didn't even care to test the rest of it because it already worked. So not looking at the full picture. Overfitting is a little bit different in my opinion. I'll read Abu's um, answer real quick before I give my opinion. Abu says, uh, the way I see overfitting is adapting a strategy to work really well on historical data to the point it becomes ineffective in the future. From my perspective, it is done by adapting to noise and news or events which are predictive of what will happen in the future, right? And that's exactly what I was gonna say. And the reason I don't think overfitting is an issue, at least not in the way that you mentioned it, is because one, right, if when creating filters, right, we're not creating filters specifically to work on historical data and not real time data, right? But two, right, with overfitting, when, when we're creating filters in our strategies, right, we're not changing them through market conditions. Does that make sense? So we're not looking at a period of consolidation and saying, well, now I'm changing my rules to do this. And then as the market trends saying, oh, well, now I'm changing my rules to do this. When we're creating filters, we're creating filters that, that are consistent throughout our historical data period, right? And that's how we can assume, right, when we make a filter that works through different market conditions of historic data, that's how we can assume that they're going to work on this specific way on this specific pair or instrument during future data periods, right? So that's why I don't think, I think that's different than overfitting. I guess it is overfitting, um, but that's the, the, the goal isn't to change things in hindsight. It's to, cha it's to change things overall. Right. And, and that makes a massive difference. Again, if we're if we're looking in hindsight and saying, oh, I would have done this during this period. Oh, now I would have done that during this period. That's not actually backtesting. Right. We're that, that's not the real value of backtesting. We're not actually backtesting. We're cheating. Right. What we want to do with our filters is we want to obviously go through data. We want to evaluate what we're seeing. We want to create filters and then we want to test those filters, those same consistent filters through that historical selection of data. Does that make sense? When you, when you, and, and when you do it that way, is there any reason to assume that it won't work on future price action? Right, there's, there's, there's no reason to assume that. Now, the only other way of overfitting is this, where, and, and again, I don't know if this is, I don't even know if, if overfitting would be the right word for this, but you can get to a point where you, it's kind of like paralysis analysis. You can get to the point where you create so many filters that you minimize your sample size so much that it's irrelevant, right? 
So again, let's say, and, and I've, I've dealt with a few traders who have done this. Let's say I start off with a sample size of, you know, I've taken 200 trades on the euro dollar. And then I go ahead and, and, and go through my data and I add like five different filters. And those filters eliminate a lot of these trades. And all of a sudden, I have a 20 trade sample size. Is that sample size now big enough to be relevant? And is it big enough to meet your rules on frequency? So that that's where, you know, that's what I first thought of when you said overfitting is creating so many filters that you eliminate the majority of your trades and, and what you're left with isn't enough to really give you any confidence or proof that that what you're doing is likely to work in the future. Now, in that case, what you would do is you'd have to go back historically, if you can, and find more data to still grow that sample size as big as possible. But that's what I think of when I, when I would say overfitting. Um, but does that make sense, Abu, what I said about the overfitting before? Where, and I don't know if you're doing it this way, but we're not, we're not changing our rules during backtesting, right? We're not adjusting our rules during the backtesting. We're creating our rules and then we're backtesting. Or if we find something during the backtesting process, we're adding that filter, but then we're going all the way back and starting over again. So even though it's funny, because even though backtesting is, is technically we're working in hindsight, we're working in hindsight, but we're simulating it like it's in real time. So we're not changing, we're not adjusting, we're not in the woulda, coulda, shoulda uh, boat. We're not, oh yeah, I would have done this that time, or yeah, I definitely would have taken targets here that time. No, we're, we're following the strict rules-based trading plan that we have, and we're just seeing how it operates through, through historical data. Um, yeah, and that and that brings up to another point. Orsi Orsi said, uh, "Too many filters get you confused with which which filters to apply to which pair." So, in the question, Abu asked, he said, you "No, know, with me personally, do I have different rules for different instruments?" And I do not. And the reason, and, and I'm not saying this is the the best or the right way. In fact, it, it's it's I'd probably be more productive and efficient just from a profitability standpoint, if I did. Um, but part of trading is, again, it, so it's consistent analysis plus consistent execution equals consistent results, right? You can do all the consistent analysis that you work that you want. If you can't consistently execute, is that going to help your trading? Yay or nay? It's not. So I used to have different rules for different pairs. And what I found was that when I started teaching, right, and teaching, it, it, it's, and I, I mean this, I don't mean this in a negative way, but it, it incorporates a distraction into your trading, right? I think we can all agree with that. Again, I, I, don't, I don't mean it as a negative way. Like I completely love what I do and I adjust it to do what I do, but teaching is a distraction, right? Because before I was teaching, right, and, and managing money, what I was doing was I was just staring at charts focused on a single thing every day, right? My trading plan and how can I extract as much profit out of the market as possible. Technically, it was how can I follow my rules to the best of my ability. But, you know, you know, you know what it really is. We want to make money doing this. Um, when I started teaching and it started implementing, hey, developing training courses, connecting with traders every day, answering emails, running live sessions, it sucked a good bit of my trading focus and energy away. And what I found myself doing, especially in, in the early years, is that I was making a lot of errors. And errors were simply due to like non-focused errors. So I was rushing through stuff. Like I, I got, I told you the story before where I, would, I took trades on the wrong account before, right? I put trades in the wrong direction before all because I'm in the middle of some like educational rant and then a trade gets filled I'm, or a, a level gets hit and I'm like, oh crap, I got to do something. And I'm just, you know how it is when you rush, you, you make, you make small mistakes. Um, so when I had different rules for different pairs in my portfolio, Right. I would often forget in the heat of the moment what I'm supposed to be doing for which pair. Right. They all kind of blend together. So I found that it was more efficient for me. I was I was more efficient as a trader as far as limiting my mistakes. If I just had a a blanket portfolio for not only my trading strategies, but my trading rules. Right. Because there was a time where I also had different portfolios for different strategies. So it's weird because my portfolio isn't the most it, it, 
it would be more profitable if it was broken up in a different way, if I had separate portfolios for different strategies and if I had different rules for different strategies within that portfolio. Um, it would be more profitable purely from a backtesting perspective. But from a real life execution perspective, the elimination of errors makes up for whatever is missed from the profitability. So that's something you have to consider. Um, how much time do you have to look at the chart? How good are you at sticking to those rules? Are you rushing? Are you doing other things? Um, are you able to execute consistently execute your strategy differently on different pairs and remember what is what? Um, I think you can, especially if you're a higher time frame trader. If you're a higher time frame trader, you don't have a lot of distractions. It's, it's much easier. Once you go down to the day trading realm, it's it gets a little bit harder because you have to be very sharp and you have very minimal amount of time to think about it, right? Swing trading, if you're on a, a four hour and above, you've got four hours, maybe even a day between decisions. You can easily go back to your notebook and be like, dollar yen, this strategy, what, what am I supposed to do? Um, once you get below the hourly, it, it's it's a different type of pressure. Um, so I've opted to do that instead of have different ones. Um, I believe you guys can correct me. I'm not quite sure, but I believe Jason has different rules and not vastly different rules, but some different tweaks on different pairs that he trades. So he's, he's a little bit different. Um, but to answer the questions at the end, uh, one, I might have answered this already. Do you personally use different filters for different pairs? If so, do you implement limitations on how significantly the filters can vary between pair to pair? So I kind of answered that already. Um, but to answer the second part of it, do I implement limitations on how significantly the filters can be different? Um, I wouldn't, right? So, and the question that, that I, I would like to ask myself, and I always ask myself a lot of questions because trading is lonely. We typically don't have anyone to talk, talk to. Um, assuming I'm okay with trading different filters or different strategies on different pairs, why would I want to limit myself? Would, would there be a reason to limit myself from putting myself in the most profitable situation? Right, that's a serious question we need to ask ourselves. So assuming I'm looking at filters and I'm adding filters and, and they're not destructive to my, my strategy, I'm finding things that work and improve it, I would never want to put limitations on there. I would never want to put limitations on there. Um, now, something to be aware of is that you could get to the point where you have so many filters that it's an entirely different strategy. And then you may have to play the game where it's like, is it still the same strategy or isn't it still the same strategy? Um, which ultimately doesn't matter, in my opinion, as long as you know what the rules are. But that could be a that could be a thing or a concern for you. But I, I don't think there would be limitations. You guys see any reasons why we'd want to put limitations on uh, aside from the the what we mentioned earlier about reducing your sample size so much that it's either irrelevant or 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 the frequency is so low that there's no point of changing i guess the only limitation i would put is make again just in strategy development in general making things so confusing that you can no longer follow it um but as far as just limitations to filter as far as you know how your strategy varies from pair to pair. Um, again, I would look at each pair as a employee, each pair as a individual. And if that individual has certain needs, then you, you go as far as those certain needs need to be productive. Um, so yeah, I don't think we need limitations again, aside from the, the sample size aspect and aside from the confusing yourself aspect. You don't want to have too many filters that you no longer know what you're doing. Um, but as far as it being dollar yen tweaks are significantly different than how I trade the euro dollar, no problem with it as long as you can follow it. Um, two, are there any steps you take to avoid overfitting your back testing? Um, and we talked about that earlier. Um, about overfitting is, is you know, it, it, I, I think the main concern that we're having with overfitting is adjusting it on the fly per market conditions. And we already kind of talked about the correct way to back test is you make filters and then you, you test it over the entirety of the sample size. Um, so if that into account, um, I think we kind of, we don't have to deal with this problem of, of overfitting. Um, and then number three, are there certain rules, filters 
you do not change between pairs? Um, and the answer would be no. I mean, you, you, you do what works. Uh, there's probably going to be a core centerpiece of your strategy. So like the centerpiece of your strategy could be like, I am a pullback trader. So in every situation, I need a pullback to structure. Or, for, or here's an example for me. So if I were to create different rules for my strategy, right, it all centers around the backbone. So the backbone of my trading is structure, right? So whether I'm creating filters of like, I need to RSI, I don't need to RSI, I need a double bottom, or I, all I need is a higher, high, higher close, or I need a pin bar, I don't need a pin bar. I can have all these varying rules, but the one thing that I still require, that centerpiece, that backbone of my trading strategy is that we need a higher, high, higher close, and then we need to pull back to structure. Or we need a lower, low, lower close, and we need to pull back to structure. So the, the core, the core element of the strategy is probably going to stay intact. Um, but but again, again, think about it like this. If, if it didn't, then you're, you're not really adding filters, right? Filters are just kind of tweaks to trade the bigger thing. Um, if we're taking away the bigger thing, then it's basically an entirely different strategy, right? So if I no longer require a higher, high, higher close and a pullback, it's no longer a pullback strategy. Now it's a a breakout strategy. So I would, look, I would just look at those as two completely different strategies at that at that point. So, but whatever your core principle is, whether it's structure, whether it's like, hey, I, I always need a Fibonacci or I always need the RSI, um, you're usually adding those filters, you're usually adding those tweaks around the strategy um, and not to the, the the core the core element of the strategy. Um, Akil says, uh, or Akil, I'm Akil. Abu says. What if one filter worked really well on one pair, but not the other pair, not or sorry, not the other ten or so pairs um, that have come back profitable from your back testing? Would you be hesitant to use the filter in this situation? I would personally have more confidence if I found one filter to work well on multiple pairs. Um, yeah, you you probably have more confidence on the more pairs it works on, um, but if and again, it depends on what the filter is, um, but. If you have one filter that worked really, really well on one pair, and again, you've done the back testing and your back testing has shown that over uh, uh, the correct amount of sample size that it's consistently profitable, is there any reason to doubt it? I mean, the numbers have shown you it works. The numbers have shown you it works. I can tell you what, once you go to, and the lesson I learned, so I did testing for a very long time on our daily chore strategy um, for about a year. And that was the first time I've tested anything on the daily chart. I've never tried, you know, daily charts always been my higher time frame. I never actually looked for trading opportunities on it. And I don't know if it's the daily chart. I don't know if it's the strategy. I I've tested a few other strategies um, on the daily chart as well. And one thing I noticed with the daily chore, and, and you'll see this all over the daily chore group, is that there was no one filter that worked on every pair. It, it, it seemed like every pair needed a different filter to, to maximize its profitability. So I wouldn't lack confidence if you have one filter that works on one pair and it doesn't work on the other pairs. Because again, if we're looking at these pairs as individuals, um, all we're asking ourselves is how can we maximize the profitability or the effectiveness, the productivity of that individual? And if we've done enough back testing, if we've done it over a, a, a good amount of sample size, I mean, the, the numbers don't lie, right? The numbers don't lie. If something has historically worked for 10 years on one pair and was consistently profitable, but it doesn't work on other pairs. I, I don't. I don't think we were able to assume it. It's not going to work on the pair that it worked on. It just means that unique filter that you added is unique to that pair. Now, in a perfect world, would we love to have a filter work on on every pair the same? Yes, that would be great. That would make our life a lot easier. That that put you in a situation I'm in, where you just have one way to trade every single thing, and it's less moving pieces. Um, but fact of the matter is, you're gonna you know different pairs are different. And you're gonna you're gonna have filters that make some pairs more profitable and make some pairs worse. But yeah, I, I think it's okay to have confidence in it. Um, I think you gotta you trust your numbers. I would say this, however, 
if you find yourself lacking confidence in it, then I would not trade it because you never want to trade something you don't have confidence in. Even if it even if it works, if you don't believe in it, if, if the if the the proof isn't enough to kind of make you believe in it, I, I wouldn't trade it because it's just going to be it's going to be cracks in your armor. You're always going to second guess it when those losing streaks come. You're going to it's going to open up the door for these wild thoughts that cause errors and errors are, are what kill traders. So that's that's my opinion. Um, do you guys have any other questions on this or anything else you want to add on this? It's a very good question. Again, I think the main takeaway from overfitting we can we can look at is remember that we're not adjusting our strategy during our back testing. We're 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 simply we're testing whatever rules or filters or tweaks we make over the entire sample size. If not, we become the hindsight trader. And the hindsight trader is always right, but never makes money. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Remember, if you're interested in learning how to trade, head over to www.tier1trading.com. We've got a whole bunch of cool stuff over there. We've got some software for you to play with. We've got some free workshops. We also have our trial membership. www.tier1trading.com. Interested in learning how to trade? That's the place you want to go.